The Euclid Space Telescope is the European Space Agency's hope to finally figure out the dark universe, if it's actually real, and if so, what even is it? So recently, ESA and Euclid Collaboration have made their first quick data release, Q1, publicly available. That's seven whole days of data. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, does it? I mean, what's even in this first data? Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Liu, and in this week's video, let's talk about the new Euclid data. The Euclid Space Telescope is ESA's dark matter, dark energy mission, equipped with optical and near-infrared instruments to make an almost all-sky 3D survey of the night sky. By accurately measuring the shapes and distances of two billion galaxies over the next six years, it will be able to figure out the distribution of dark matter through the warping of galaxies due to its gravitational influence on them, an effect known as gravitational lensing. And it will also reveal how dark energy influences the distribution of galaxies and dark matter in our universe. The Q1 data release is a preview of what's to come. It's a testing ground, if you will, containing just seven days of data. The initial Q1 data release covers a total area of 63.1 square degrees across three specific regions. These are the Euclid Deep Fields, the Euclid Deep Field North, EDFN, Euclid Deep Field South, EDFS, and Euclid Deep Field Fornax, EDFF. But even within this relatively small area, representing only a fraction of the final survey, they detected approximately 30 million astronomical objects. The Euclid deep fields are regions on the sky that Euclid will observe repeatedly throughout its mission. And by doing so, these patches will become a lot deeper than the full Euclid survey. By the end of the mission, the EDFs are expected to be about two magnitudes deeper, which means that the deep fields will detect much fainter objects compared to the wide survey. In astronomy, a magnitude of one difference corresponds to a factor of 2.5 in brightness, specifically 2.512 because this is a logarithmic scale. So two magnitudes deeper means that the deep fields would detect objects that are approximately 6.3 times fainter than what the wide survey can detect. But not only will it be able to pick up these areas of fainter objects, but also it will improve the signal to noise ratio on them. So the galaxies will be easier to identify from the background noise. This increased depth will then allow astronomers to study high redshift galaxies. So those that are really, really far away. These are young galaxies where we can learn about how galaxies formed and evolved. We know that for cosmological studies and studies of dark energy that Euclid intends to do, we need to look at the large scale structure. So as much of the sky as possible. So it might not seem so useful. These deep fields are actually really important because they serve as reference fields for calibrating the wider Euclid survey. They act as special calibration zones where Euclid can measure stars very precisely, allowing it to accurately set its zero point. These ensure that all its brightness measurements across the entire sky are reliable and comparable for the entirety of the mission. Each field is chosen specifically to maximize scientific return. They overlap with areas previously studied to leverage existing data. For example, the Fornax field is centered on the Chandra Deep Field South, CDFS, which has loads of deep observations from NASA's X-ray telescope Chandra and many more. In fact, you might have heard me talking about this before, but in my collaboration, we just want a big observation time to observe this particular region with ESA's X-ray telescope, XMM-Newton. 1,000 hours of X-ray observations. But anyway, let's get on with it then and have a look at these images. First up is Euclid Deep Field North. This is 23 square degrees and 10 million galaxies here. The faint blue structures in the image are dim clouds between the stars and our own galaxy. They're a mix of gas and dust that we call galactic cirrus. And this is because they look like cirrus clouds clouds that we have here on Earth. Just below the center left of the image lies the Cat's Eye Nebula, also known as NGC 6543, and this is the type of nebula formed by a dying star ejecting its outer layers of gas. 
Despite the name, the process has nothing to do with planet formation. The Cat's Eye Nebula is one of the most complex planetary nebulae ever observed. Its intricate structure with its rings and jets is difficult to explain using existing theories of planetary nebula formation. And at the center of this lies a hot dying star, roughly 10,000 times more luminous than our sun. It's shedding its outer layers as it transitions into a white dwarf. This nebula is 0.2 light years across. And in the paper, they also mentioned capturing another planetary nebula, PNK116, in this field. But I didn't have any luck finding this one, so maybe you can have a look. The Altieri ring, the first Einstein ring that Euclid discovered, and the most perfect one at that, is also found in this image. Such Einstein rings form when the gravity of a massive object, like a galaxy, would bend the light from a more distant background galaxy. And this creates a ring-like image around the foreground galaxy, but they have to be perfectly aligned. This, however, isn't the only gravitationally lens galaxy in the Euclid Q1 dataset, and in fact, Q1 also released a catalogue of 500 Galaxy Galaxy strong lens candidates, almost all of which were previously unknown. Here are just some of them. Now, these were identified by AI and then manually inspected by citizen scientists and experts. And remember, this is only seven days of data. There are six years to come. Now, let's take a look at Euclid Deep Field South. This field is a lot larger than the North. It covers about 28 square degrees. Again, so many galaxies here of all shapes and sizes. Some are seen edge on, some are merging, and you have this beautiful galaxy cluster with all the arcs from gravitational lensing, where the gravity of the galaxy cluster, both in the form of galaxies and dark matter, is pulling on the light emitted by the distant galaxies and thus distorting the appearances of their shapes. Now, whilst this is impressive, the gravitational lensing that is at Euclid's core, what Euclid is made for, is weak gravitational lensing, which is a lot more subtle than this strong lensing that we're seeing. It's not something that you can see with your naked eye, but instead have to find statistical significances when you average over hundreds and thousands of galaxies. Now, the last deep field is the Fornax field, something that I'm going to be working on. Now, this is the smallest of the three, only 12 square degrees in size, but there's 4.5 million galaxies in this field. This region is low in galactic dust, so dust from our Milky Way, and also low star density, making it ideal for studying distant galaxies and the early universe. In the Fornax field, we catch the edge of the Robin's Egg Nebula, NGC 1360. This is another planetary nebula, so the final stage in the evolution of a sun-like star shedding its outer layers. It has a distinctive egg shape, and often it appears with this blue-green hue in images, and this is largely due to the strong emissions from doubly ionized oxygen atoms in the expanding gas cloud. The nebula is illuminated by a very hot central star system, and this is known to be a binary, likely consisting of an O-type star and a white dwarf. Now, that's not all. In addition to the three deep fields, the Q1 release also included data from Lynn's Dark Nebula 1641. Now, this is a part of the Orion A cloud. Although it's not easily accessible unless you dive into the archives, which luckily for you, I did this for you. Yes, you are worth it. This is a star forming region obscured by dust and hence its designation of being a dark nebula or dark cloud. But actually, this region isn't dark at all. When you're looking at the region through the eyes of Euclid's Vis instrument, which sees in the optical wavelengths, it doesn't seem to be many stars here. And that's important. I'll tell you why next. But as seen in NISP, the near-infrared light can penetrate dust much better and reveals so much more stars and filamentary-like structures. These are young stellar objects, or YSOs for short. They're essentially protostars, newly formed stars still enveloped in gas and dust and a prime place to study star formation.
But this isn't typical of what Euclid will observe. It's actually a very unique target, and it was needed for Euclid's performance verification. The goal of these observations was to check and enhance the spacecraft's ability to guide itself accurately, particularly in regions in the sky that lack sufficiently bright stars for guidance. With the Q1 data release came 27 scientific papers, and some of these were describing the data and data processing, but there was also science as well, demonstrating the mission's capabilities, even with this early tiny amount of data. So topics ranging from studying nearby dwarf galaxies, galaxy morphology, star formation across cosmic time, investigating AGN, and of course, the numerous new strong gravitational lenses that we saw. Also, there were some analyzing galaxy clusters and their environments too. Many of these papers also emphasized developing and testing automated analysis methods, including AI, in preparation for the much larger future Euclid data release. But notably, no cosmological science papers yet. They're still to come. Anyway, it's all there, so if you want to go play with it, go for it. All links down below. That's all I have time for this week. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share, and subscribe. Hey space cats, fly with me to the stars, faster than light, soaring past Mars.